Good to have you this morning. Is anyone excited to be in church today? Man, the Spirit's just moving. I'm so excited, and, and Pastor August is is preaching over there, and you know, we're coming together to pray and, and ask God's direction for the sermon and kind of write together, and, and uh, we just kind of had a light bulb thing today of how, like kind of beautifully it matches up with baby dedication today and just the Lord's family, and we're going to be talking about that. So I think the Lord's already moving, and uh, I'm just excited uh, to, to be able to continue our series in Genesis. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in chapter 21 of Genesis Starting in verse eight, you can turn there. Before I do that, can I show you a picture of my kids? It's been a while since I've been in this service. So uh, this is, uh, you can put that first picture up there, Hayden. Um, that's Judah on the left and Lily. Um, Lily, poor soul, she's gonna be tough. Judah just beats the tar out of her, but uh, makes her, you know, puts her in hats and stuff. And, and uh, this is another picture, they're best buddies hanging out. Um, this, is, this is what we'd like it to be in all the parents in the room. The next picture, you can put that up. This is reality. Uh, you, you, I thought it was like, oh, he's being nice. He wanted to like, you know, cuddle her and hang out. He actually was getting in position for a choke, a rear, you know, behind the choke. So it's good form though, at least. Um, so that's good, but it's fun. Uh, Judah's two months or two years and three months and Lily's turning seven months here. So it's fun. It's crazy. We're blessed. But Genesis chapter 21, a uh, quick context for you. So today we're going to be highlighting Hagar and Ishmael uh, and, and kind of their continuation of their story in the midst of God's story. And so last time we saw them uh, uh, specifically was in Genesis 16. Um, God made this promise to Abraham and Sarah that he's going to have a son and that son is going to be blessed, and through the whole world is going to be blessed through his son Isaac, who wasn't born yet, and um, Sarah can't get pregnant. You know, she takes matters into her own hands. Uh, Hagar was an Egyptian slave and says, Abram, you should sleep with her. That's how we can have a kid, because I can't. Not a great decision. She gives birth to, uh, Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, um, and uh, she, from the very get-go, we, we see kind of turmoil and kind of trouble um, amongst the family, amongst Ishmael and Hagar and Sarah, and I kind of look at this story and go, I wonder why there's weirdness in the family. This is weird. Um, and so she ran away one time, Hagar did, and God met her in the, in the wilderness, in the desert, and um, it, 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 in a powerful way, God reached out to her and said, because, you know, because of my blessing and my promise to Abram, uh, it will continue in a different way through Ishmael, because uh, you're a part of the family. And so uh, we, we pick up, uh, and now Ishmael's 16, around the 15 to 17 years old, maybe 16. Um, Isaac has been born now uh, in this story. And so I'm picking up in verse eight, it says, Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abram prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion, uh, but Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abram, uh, Abraham and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of her son, Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, get rid of that slave woman and her son. He's not gonna share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. I won't have it. It's just, we'll, we'll pause there. It's funny to me. It is funny to me, and I can't, I can't laugh too hard because we are this, <laughs> we, are, we are these characters in scripture. We make mistakes like this, but it's funny to me looking from the outside in that Sarah is having so much turmoil, so much like comparison and, and struggle and drama, and I'm just shaking my head going, isn't this what you wanted? Isn't this what you wished for, what you hoped for, and then ultimately what you acted out? This is what you wanted. And it's kind of like she's complaining about the consequences of her own choices. It's kind of ridiculous to me, and uh, it just makes a further statement to me that God's plans are always better than our plans. Not just his plans, but the way he carries out his plans are always better than the way that we try to carry out his plans, amen? It's always better, it's always better. So picking up in verse 11, this upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son, but God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever she tells you, for Isaac 
is the son through, your, uh, through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will, make, I will also make a nation out of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he's your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son. She wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. Then when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a, bu- uh, of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself, about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, and she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying. We'll focus on that. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make him a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. Land of Egypt. And we know God's promise came true. God used you know, and blessed Ishmael through, I, uh, through Abraham, and he became a great nation. Uh, that is still evident today in that region, a great, powerful nation. And uh, I just want to highlight two, two quick things this morning for us, and then we are going to have a, an opportunity uh, to come to the altar. And once again, there's, there's nothing different about the altar other than we say, you know, I'm making a, a physical statement that's reflecting an inward spiritual movement in my heart or commitment in my heart I'm doing I'm acting on it physically and so there'll be opportunity for that but the point I want to make here first is that God sees you he hears you and he will meet you where you are where you are I think it's you know this is the second time that Hagar is in this wilderness physically she's in a desperate situation physically her circumstances have become dire and she's run out of everything food, water, and she literally thinks and is trending towards death. And it says that she and the boy cry out. And I love, and we skim over this too much, that I love the fact that God says, I heard the cry. I heard your cries, I saw your tears, I saw your weeping, and I'm responding just where you are. So my son Judah, he, um, he got sick last Sunday uh, in the middle of the night, and I happened to be downstairs, and uh, uh, my wife was somewhere. She wasn't at home. I think she was, we had a girls' event um, on Friday, so she was gone. Judah was sleeping. I was downstairs, and his monitor had died. So normally when we put him down, no problems. Like, I have the monitor on, but I've never, whatever. He's a good sleeper. He passes out. And so I'm downstairs doing something, and the monitor had died, and I thought, well, it's, it's whatever. I'm going up there soon. Uh, he'll be fine. Well, uh, I couldn't see him, and I couldn't hear him. And come to find out, he sat up in his bed and threw up everywhere. Uh, I won't spare you the details, but I've never scooped. I'll just use the word scooped. <laughs> Sorry, that's a detail. My bad. It was horrible. But... He, he threw up, and he was crying, and I couldn't hear him. I was downstairs. I couldn't see him. And I don't know, I don't know exactly when he threw up, but I went upstairs a time period later, and he had, he had fallen back asleep on top of the puke. And I felt about, like, the worst human in the planet. I thought, could, how long has it been since this happened? I couldn't hear him crying. I couldn't see him. And I just felt like a terrible dad, like just the worst of the worst. And then uh, I had to clean it all up. And then, praise the Lord, multiple hours later, after all cleaning, he did it again. And we had to clean it up again. But I was there. I heard it that time. Um, I wish I hadn't heard it because I heard it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> details, details. But it's a simple fact, and it got me thinking about this. The fact that God hears us is so powerful. That the God Almighty, the God of the, of the universe, a vastness of majesty, that that God, that that Heavenly Father hears us. 
And why is that important? Because if he hears us, he can help us. Because I couldn't hear Judah, I couldn't help him. I didn't know he was in trouble. And so do not neglect the fact that God hears you. Don't neglect the fact that your cries and your tears and your, your groans to him, that he hears those things. I, th I, I love that in Psalm 56, eight, it says, you keep track of all of my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. This just screams intimacy, screams that your tears are not wasted, that they don't just fall on deaf ears, that it's not some distant, far off God that's like, I'm so much farther above that. Like, come on, you're really crying about that? No, he actually cares about everything. Think about it, every time that you've been afraid, he sees it. Every time that you've ever cried, both externally or internally, he sees it, he hears it. That is a powerful, encouraging statement for anybody today. No matter what you're going through, no matter how many tears you cry, no matter the groans of your heart or your mouth, God hears you right where you are at. We also read that he is near to the brokenhearted, that just like Pastor Brian said, we can cast all of our cares, anxieties on him because he cares for us. He keeps them because he cares. I love this about uh, Hagar when she uh, and Ishmael, you know, when they went to the wilderness for the first time and God showed up, well, Ishmael wasn't there, but when she went there for the first time, God showed up, she called God by a different name than a normal name, and I love it. She calls him El Roy, the God who sees me. That's how she called him, the God who sees me. And she didn't just stop there, she named her son Ishmael. Do you know what Ishmael means? God hears. God hears. She, made, she knew this in her life and in her heart that God hears me and he sees me. I'm not alone, that he's near to me. And I love how scripture gives details and this angel says God hears you and hears the boy's cries where he is, where he is. God heard them right in the middle of it right where they were at, right in the middle of fear, right in the middle of hopelessness, right in the middle of crying, right in the middle of pain. He meets us and hears us right where we're at. He does not wait until we can wipe the tears away and get up off the floor and respond in an act of faith. Thank the Lord. Judah, I didn't respond to Judah because he cleaned himself up and then I came to him I responded because, and the second time, because he cried. And God responds when we cry out to him. Not when we get ourselves cleaned up enough to have a statement of faith and bring our polishedness to him, but he wants our raw, he wants our real, he's a good father. He's a good father, he can handle those things. He cares about how we feel. I think, can I expound on this for a second? I feel like sometimes we have this kind of subconscious culture in, in church that, that, that being a Christian means I can't really have these crazy emotions. Like being a Christian and having faith means I can't, I can't cry out, I can't be, you know, I can't be full of fear, I can't be having moments of doubt or hopelessness, that, that's not, that's against what I, you know, that's what against what I sing, that's against, and we kind of have this subconscious, like I shouldn't be crying out, or I, I just need to numb those emotions or those thoughts, I just, you know, just, just neglect them, put them aside, don't even, don't even think about them, um, you know, because we, we choose faith and faith over fear, and I think that's true, but, but, but a, a relationship with Jesus isn't escapism. It's not, it's not I, I'm just like magically and mentally pulled out of a situation. Like I'm still in it. Like I'm still struggling. I'm still crying. I'm not just, I'm not just in la-la land because I'm a Christian. Woohoo! nothing's going bad because I have faith. No, it's not, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not leaving reality. I'm not neglecting my circumstances just because I trust God, but I'm in the midst of it because biblical faith never requires you to deny reality, doesn't it? It doesn't require me to deny what's going on and just like magically disappear from it. It doesn't mean I ignore my problems, I ignore how I feel, or I ignore the pain. It doesn't mean that, that I deny the facts of what's going on. It doesn't mean that I deny having emotions or problems. 
And it doesn't, doesn't deny my need and my desperation for God to move. Faith doesn't deny reality, but faith believes God can change reality, doesn't it? Having faith believes and acts on God's word in and through our current reality, in our current state, in our current wilderness, in the middle of our current pain. Having faith in Jesus doesn't mean that I just like don't look at my problems, but in the fact having faith in Jesus means I can stare directly at my problems and still trust that God is in me, in, in, in me, with me, in the midst of it, hearing me, seeing me, that I can trust him, that he's bigger than what I'm facing. Here's an example, look at Abraham as we fast forward in Romans four. Look at Abraham in this fact. Even when, in verse 18, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years age, he figured, he figured, this also word can be considered, he considered, he thought about, he recognized that his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in, in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises because of Abraham's faith. God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit, it was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who has raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Abraham's faith, didn't ne just neglect that he was old as dirt and that his, his wife was barren. And it says in scripture, her womb was dead. It said he considered it. He, he thought about it. He acknowledged it and still had faith. It wasn't that he just wishfully just turned a blind eye. No, 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 no. It was he acknowledged it and yet he said, but God is faithful. But God spoke at his problem, in the midst of it, in the midst of it. He didn't let his circumstances or his feelings dictate his choices of his faith, but he still looked right in the face of his circumstances. I love this, and I've heard it said this way, faith doesn't deny reality, it denies reality's authority. It denies reality's authority, what does that mean? I don't deny what's going on in my life, but what I do reject is the fact that those things, that circumstances, my feelings are gonna dictate my choices. I will choose to, to have faith in Christ. I will choose to have faith in his word, in his promise, in his blessing, in his faithfulness. You see what I'm saying here? We're not just escapists. We recognize there's stuff going on in my life. And my prayer isn't, God, close my eyes to what's going on. My prayer is, God, open my eyes to see you in the midst of it in the middle of it, see you all around me. I think the Bible is oftentimes a lot more raw and real about feelings and emotions and cries and frustrations than we are. I mean, if God didn't want you to bring all of that to him in a raw form, there would be a lot of scripture that would not be in the Bible today. A lot of stories, a lot of great men and women of faith that are bringing raw and real emotion to him that are crying out in a very real way, that are not denying what's going on, and yet they bring it to Christ, they bring it to God, so that he can move in the midst of it. He's a good father, and he wants it. He wants us to cry out to him. He wants to hear you. He, want, he wants to know what's going on. Why would we try to hide our emotions from God? He sees it anyways. He sees everything down to our thoughts and our emotions. I love this story because God sees them right in the midst of it. He hears them and he's moving. But I, I think as you fast forward through the generations and you see God's hand on Ishmael's line and, and I think it's pretty radical. Think of like Jews of Jesus' time reading this and they know the context of that Hagar was from Egypt 
and I don't think they have the best view of Egypt. They, 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 they don't have the best view of their neighbors <laughs> because they're not God's chosen people, and yet Ishmael becomes part of the family. I think that's a radical part of this story, and it kind of doesn't make sense. This is out of disobedience. It's out of adultery. It's, it's not like a pretty story, and yet God invites them into the family. God invites them right into the family. And my, point, my second point of this kind of takeaway is that anybody can be a part of the family. Anybody can be a part of the family of God. Anybody can be a part. Isn't it amazing in scripture who gets invited by God to be a part of his family? Think about it. Like I said, Hagar's an Egyptian slave woman forced into a relationship that she never wanted. She gets a part of it. Rahab the prostitute gets a part of it, gets an invitation. Zacchaeus, the, the notorious sinner. We, get, we see a prodigal son. We see a stuck up son. We see a the blind, the poor, the outcast, the hurting, the unclean, the needy. They get invited. The Samaritan woman who was the oppressed. And then we see a Roman centurion who was the oppressor. Everybody gets an invitation into the family of God. Everybody gets an invitation. Jesus died for everybody. That means everybody gets invited. Unfortunately, not everybody accepts, but everybody is invited. And that's radical for us to realize. First Timothy 2, 1 through 6 says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. So stop there. Pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. God wants everybody to be saved. We see it through his heart, through all of scripture, Old Testament and New, that his heart is that everybody is saved. Everybody hears the truth. Everybody gets invited and in accepted into his family. For there's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. He gave his life to purchase freedom for a select few, freedom for God's chosen, freedom for the Jews, freedom, freedom for everyone. What good news this morning. Not just for you in the place, if you feel like you're not a part of God's family, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how, how dirty you feel or how far you feel. You're invited. You're invited. And Jesus paid for the invitation. You're invited. And if you are in the family of God this morning, that should be a challenge to your heart that everybody you come in contact with, everybody that we see, everybody that we hate, everybody that we don't like, everyone that's different or the same as me, everyone around us is invited. And I am now a part of getting them to accept that invitation. I am a part of continuing to extend that invitation because of what Jesus did, everybody is invited. Not, nobody is excluded unless they so choose, which is unfortunate, but God's heart, like I said, is for everybody. Worship team, could you come up? This is good news. This is good news. That everybody, I love this thought, that they're just one decision away from being a part of God's family. One decision away. One decision away, no matter how, how much they struggle, no matter their current state, isn't that what unconditional love means? That whatever condition we're found in, there's still love for us and for those people. Galatians 3.26 says, for you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We have faith in him, we're a part of his family. John 1.12, uh, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I love that. Jesus doesn't just pay for our sins, but he adopts us into his family if we choose him. He adopts us. We need to start seeing people that way. This is a twofold charge this morning. That if you are in a place and you're like, man, I need to cry out, like I, I'm struggling, encouragement, God sees you and hears you. He's a good father. And twofold, 
Maybe you're not in that situation, but it's a, it's a reminder for all of us. Do I treat everyone, do I see everyone as just one decision away, as an, an invited guest into the family of God? Look at the story of Zacchaeus and I'll wrap up with this. Jesus is walking through Jericho and little Zacchaeus, I'm not gonna sing the song because believe it or not, I'm worse than Pastor Zach at singing. So there you go. Um, in the story, we see all sorts of names for Zacchaeus. Everything but Zacchaeus, notorious sinner, chief tax collector, all these descriptions. He stole money from his own people. He was a thief and a traitor, notorious. He was friends and worked with the Romans. Jesus is walking and Zacchaeus climbs a tree just to get a glimpse. And Jesus stops and turns. And we just read over this sometimes without some, some diving deep a little bit. Jesus turns and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Come down, I wanna eat at your house. This is crazy because um, people, even the writer of the gospel called Zacchaeus everything but his name. Like I said, notorious, traitor, sinner, thief. But Jesus turns and calls him Zacchaeus. It's the first time we see his name called, not just described. Zacchaeus, you know what Zacchaeus means? Zacchaeus means clean or pure by God. What an example for us today that Jesus did not see people for their past, nor did he see them really for their present state. But he saw them for their future. He saw them for the potential that they could be a part of my family. Clean or pure by God. Do we see people that way? When I see somebody, whether they're a down and out, a homeless, or, or just somebody, what's my first thought of them? Is it, is it, clean and pure by God. They could be clean and pure by God. They could be a part of this family with me. Or is it something else? Jesus treated people based on who they could be in him, not on their past, who they could become. They tr he treated people based on what he did and not what they have done. And we pick up that mantle as the family of God to do the same. Everybody gets invited. And I need to treat everybody. Think about that. Everybody has a potential to be a housing place for the Holy Spirit. Everybody. Everybody, whether they are in the family of God or not, are still created in the image of God. Everybody. Just one decision away. Would you stand all across the room with me? We're just going to have a short time and we have some time. So please be intentional with this time. And so it's twofold. Man, do you need to run to the Father this morning for your situation? If you need prayer, it's a perfect place. This is a beautiful, perfect place of support and love. If you've seen, we love each other. We support each other. To bring those, those raw emotions, to bring what you feel, to bring what you're thinking, to bring your circumstance to God. This morning is your morning. And if maybe you're not in a situation that's desperate, would, would you commit this morning? God, change, like how do I see people? How do I treat people? Do I see them as invited? God, help me break my heart, Lord, for what breaks yours. You know, I love that thought, but the crazy thought of that prayer is if God answered that fully, like 100% answered that prayer, we would be giving our kids away, wouldn't we? Because he gave his kid away because he loved people so much. Like if God fully answered that for us, I believe he shields us from that sometimes, <laughs> like a fully opening his heart because we'd be giving our houses away. We'd be giving our, we'd be doing everything just as he moved heaven and earth for his people, for his creation to be a part of his family. Would you bow your heads? Before we sing this song, I just wanna give a moment. If there's anybody in this room that you would say, I am not a part of this family. I wanna be a part of the family of God. Doesn't matter where I've been, what I've done, what I, where I'm currently at. 
that Jesus died for me and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna throw my sins away. I wanna turn from my sins. I want, I wanna be a part of God's family. I wanna run to the Father this morning. I just wanna pray over you. Even if you're watching online, I wanna pray over you. And if you would be so honest with nobody looking around and just raise your hand so we can pray, you would say, man, that's me. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna accept that invitation finally. I, I wanna come to Jesus. I wanna be a part of this family. Go ahead and raise your hand if that's you. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So the charge remains for the rest of us, for all of us, really. Jesus, help us to treat and see people like you do. Not just to think, but act and, and, and serve and love people like you do. That we get a part to help bring people to the Father, to bring people to you, God. I pray as we sing this song, would we just make a, a step of commitment, a step of faith, God, uh, to say, I, I, I need to do this better. Even if I've been doing it well, God, I still commit to being a part, God. I wanna bring people to you. Because God, we are in the last days and we don't have time to waste. And so God, help us this morning as we sing this song, would we just commit to you in your name, amen. If you need prayer, please come down to the altar this morning for anything and if you want to say I'm committing to this we'd love to have you at the altar as well as a physical sign to say I'm going to treat people and see people as God would you come oh, is this challenge us church can we go be like Jesus I know that's thrown around a lot it's not a cliche I mean can we really stop and see people how he sees them I bet if we slow down a little bit and we stopped I bet God would show us more people give us more opportunities, lead us in more directions. You don't have to be an extrovert to love people like Jesus. Just stop and see. Because truly how we see, you know, how we see people determines how we treat them. How we see them. And so that's my prayer. That's my prayer for our church. You know, because it's not just on, it's not just the pastors that's going out. Like you, you're the church. You're, you're the hands and feet of Jesus. And so we can do that together, amen. Amen. God is already moving his spirit. I don't know if you can feel it. God is moving his spirit. There is, there's, he is doing a mighty work and he wants you to be a part of it. And he wants everyone to come to his family. So Jesus, we just thank you once again. God, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us, first and foremost, that we got invited to be a part of your family. So God, I pray that that reminder, that passion, that, that grace and mercy that we experience daily, God, help us to use that to push us to people. God, would we become a little bit more urgent? God, would we become a little bit more bold? Would we become a little bit more loving and sacrificial in how we serve? God, with the people we come in contact with. God, help us to see people like you do. Open our eyes, Lord, open our hearts. Just like the song says, we give you, we offer our lives to you to use us for however you want to use us for people. So God, I thank you in advance for the mighty work that's going to be done in our workplaces, in our families, in, 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 in the grocery store, on the people we come in contact with in this church to see your spirit poured out, your love poured out on people. We just love you, Jesus, in your mighty name, amen. I'm so glad that I took a risk to believe, as Paul said to in the Bible, to not despise youth. You know, David did great feats when he was young, made mistakes when he was old. And that God has raised up our young pastors to be able to give a word like this. And we appreciate you, Luke. We appreciate all of our young pastors. And and if the Holy Spirit spoke to you like he did me, sometimes uh, when you're, you're really outgoing, you, you, you talk more than you should and you don't listen enough and carefully enough. God has the ability to hear everybody all over and he listens, but we have the ability to hear the people in front of us. Swift to hear, James says, slow to speak and slow to anger. May my heart be able to really hear and listen to people that I can respond the way God would. 
You know, tonight, last the Sunday nights, the Holy Spirit has been so strong because the people coming on Sunday night are going after God and want to really be here. And I want to urge you, would you help us if you want to see a miraculous move of God to come together on Sunday nights? We'll be worshiping, we'll be hearing word, we'll be entering into the presence of God. And on Sunday nights, I can, I can feel as if the rain, physical rain of God is pouring down and melting around us. And I know that Sunday night tradition to have another church service is because people were wanting so much of God and God was doing so much. Once just wasn't enough and they wanted more God. So if it fits in your schedule, young people, old people, anyone that can, get out tonight and let's gather together in this place all together and let's worship Jesus and go after God. Amen. May God's face shine upon you and give you peace. May his love rise up in you and overflow in you like a river to a thirsty, dry world so that God would be known among the people of the world in you. God bless you as you go. Find a class if you have time to go to a study class during this time, 10 o'clock. And God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Luke. And God bless you online.